we are not going to solve the problem of cancer without concentrating on the bottom of the pyramid, which is to prevent cancer from occurring in the first place. And I, I will talk a lot more about it because we know much more about it, about that bottom of the pyramid than we knew before. The, the middle of the pyramid um, would be a broad category, but we might call it secondary prevention or early detection, uh, finding cancer in its early phases and removing it so that it does not spread and metastasize in the body because, of course, for most cancers, it's metastatic cancer that kills you, not the primary tumor generally. Mm -hmm. The top of the pyramid is cancer treatment. So again, prevention, early detection, treatment. Vast amounts of resources and a vast amount of national attention and international attention is paid at the top of the pyramid, and there's good reason for that, it, uh, for, for treatment. And of course, immunotherapy is one example of that, is, 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 is the capacity to treat cancer using the immune system. But it's important to remember that it's the bottom of the pyramid that, re that deserves attention in the next decade or so. And it's important to remember that all these three parts communicate with each other. These are not isolated silos. So let me talk a little bit about prevention and we can come and talk more globally about, uh, about treatment in a second. What do we know now about cancer prevention as the landscape has evolved? Well, number one, the one surprising thing and one disturbing thing about what we know about the bottom of the pyramid is that for the last decade or so, and this is going to be a provocative, controversial statement, so push, push back, push back That's on what it. what we want, yeah. For the last decade or so, I would argue, we have not found removable human chemical carcinogens of substantial impact. Our capacity to find removable human chemical carcinogens of substantial numerical impact has gone down dramatically. That does not mean that they don't exist. Of course, tobacco smoke is rampant, it's a huge carcinogen, but we've known that since the 1980s, 1950s, 1960s, you might say. Uh, big carcinogens that really we haven't been able to find. Uh, when people ask me, what do I do uh, in my own life as an oncologist to avoid cancer, I'm not doing anything different in 2017 that I wasn't doing in 1997, mm -hmm. fundamentally speaking. So there are three possible reasons for this. Reason one is, that we, haven't, we aren't finding them because we don't have the right tools. Reason two is that they do exist, but they're death by a thousand cuts. So there are many of them, they have impact, they're somehow additive, they're adding themselves up in, in the body. And reason three is that maybe they don't exist in the way that we, that, that we think they exist. In fact, some or a, a fraction of cancer uh, uh, is the result of changes in DNA um, that are acquired when cells divide and make mistakes. Now, that is not to say that there aren't carcinogens that we should not be tackling, that's a double negative. In other words, that is to say that there are carcinogens that we should be tackling, human papillomavirus, tobacco smoke, and other viruses that are rampant across the world which we can vaccinate against, other forms of carcinogens. But the point is that we need to learn much, much more about the bottom of the pyramid and that we are learning a, a lot more about the bottom of the pyramid. So I'd like to concentrate as we move along in the panel um, at, at what we know now about the bottom of that pyramid. So I, I definitely want to do that. But Julia, I, for, if you'll forgive me, Sid, I want to go to the top of the pyramid for just a second. And that's because, um, so you work for MSD, which is part of Merck. Merck has been a, uh, a pioneering leader in the case of immunotherapy for cancer. But you've also been, in a previous life, uh, the head of the Center for Disease uh, Prevention uh, and uh, for control, CDC uh, Control and Prevention. And, and a huge part of that is the bottom of the pyramid. So you're, you've had some experience on both. My question is, do you think that the progress we're making at the top of the period, pyramid is substantial enough to, to make a difference, um, given, given what you know about the, the uh, ongoing uh, challenge of the yeah, burden. And first of all, thank you for including me on the panel, and, and thanks to everyone who's here to listen and learn. Um, you know, you really said yourself at the beginning, if, we're, if we have 18 million new cases of cancer a year, yeah. we are not succeeding at the bottom of that pyramid. So um, clearly we have a lot of work to do in that area. And, you know, th there are drivers for those numbers. And one of the biggest drivers, of course, is the aging of our population because, as you said, the accumulation of our duration on Earth also accumulates changes in our DNA that probably predispose us to cancer. Um, but we're also um, living in an environment where there are enormous disparities in the 
incidence of cancer, not just geographic disparities, but socioeconomic disparities and exposure disparities in some cases. But I think the third thing um, that we're learning is that we really can bend the curve. So we have pockets where we are seeing relative success in cancer um, prevention and control, and I'll, I'll just mention a couple, we, tobacco in countries that really have implemented comprehensive tobacco control programs, the curve is bending on lung cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a tremendous public health success. Granted, it took decades uh, to get there and we still have a long way to go, but you know we can uh, change the shape of that pyramid. I think the other um, that you mentioned in terms of HPV as a carcinogen, we're seeing now that uh, a combination of vaccination and screening for HPV disease and, and hopefully early and better treatments really can essentially eliminate cervical cancer. At least it's technically possible to, um, to have that conversation. Again, massive disparities and we have a long way to go to get there. Um, and the last thing I would say is just um, in terms of the uh, of the, 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 the science of the situation. Mm. Probably the, the biggest curve bender ahead of us really relates to the breakthroughs in, in the science that we now have at our disposal, the tools in our toolbox. You mentioned the CART-T therapy or the, the gene therapy for a child with leukemia, Minister, but there are so many um, new modalities now that we really, um, this is the time to have the decade against cancer because we do have the tools in our toolbox. So, so Julie, let me follow up on some of these bending curves. So um, in the case of cervical cancer, we have made tremendous strides in the developed world, but in sub-Saharan Africa, it's still a major killer of women. And what was frightening is the latest report from, from the World Health Organization showed that lung cancer rates globally were rising in women in large part because of a lack of tobacco control programs in much of the world. Um, you know, this is a challenge of, when we talk about cancer, we're talking about hundreds of diseases, and we're also talking about huge disparities in terms of the kinds of people who get it and where, they're, where they are and how they're being treated. Um, even in the developed world, we see dramatically different rates in survival between black Americans, for example, and white Americans. Um, and so how do we begin to address these disparities with the structure that we have? Well, one way of thinking about it is to remember that the pyramid that we're talking about um, does um, demonstrate that the biggest value comes from addressing the base mm. and prevention on a per capita basis is much cheaper than any treatment that we have at the tip of the pyramid. So we do need to think differently about how we prioritize our investments. And the prevention yeah. investments are always, if not cost savings, cost effective. So if you, if you prevent cancer, you're reducing both ends of the cancer burden, the new cases and the deaths, as opposed to just the mortality. Mickey, this mm. is, you know, we talk sometimes in these big statistics, you have a statistic of one, um, which is why you got into this. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about uh, the experience with your father being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Yeah, yeah. So to self my, uh, self a little bit, uh, I'm an internet entrepreneur. I started my own company, Rakuten, 22 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you know, nobody really believe uh, anybody will buy something on the internet. So I'm kind of disruptive, uh, crazy entrepreneur. Uh, but kind of survived for the last 22 years. If you look at back on, probably Amazon and ourselves are only, only two companies survived this long. Uh, and then uh, we, our family, uh, found out my father uh, had a pancreatic cancer uh, six years ago. Uh, at that time, I didn't have much knowledge about the cancer, to be very honest, but I love my mother, father, uh, and I'm kind of crazy <laughs> enough uh, to start my journey uh, exploration uh, to find the most advanced cure against pancreatic cancer. So I, literally I travel all around the world. Uh, I went to Stanford, UCSF, UC San Diego, I went to Columbia, Harvard, Paris University, many universities in Japan. And conclusion was other than very, very toxic uh, combination <laughs> therapy, there was no uh, you know, good cure. Uh, and, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, my friend, who is a client of my business, called me, and he was also a friend of my father. 
tell me, hey, Mickey, my cousin is doing this very interesting research at NCI. Uh, he's Japanese. And he's, what is it? And he said, he's using lights to cure the cancer. Using light to lights. cure the cancer, yeah. So I said, give me a break, right? right? How can you cure the cancer with light? Uh, but I was desperate. So, and he said, by the way, uh, President Obama mentioned about this project in his inauguration speech. I said, oh, I better, I better go and you know, check it out. So uh, I met a meeting uh, with them. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, kind of, we, uh, my chin dropped and eye-opening, uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for me. Uh, what it is, uh, basically, we create a conjugate of antibody mm -hmm. uh, with some, some special chemical, and which certainly react only to certain type of lights. Yeah. And, they were, they, and they, they were just trying on the animals at the time. I saw it. And when I spoke with my... Uh, doctor friends about this. 99% of them said, hey, Miki, those kind of things work on animal, but it never worked on human. Mm -hmm. But I was amateur enough. No, 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 this is going to work. It really doesn't, because we're not talking about uh, chemical reaction or biological action. We're talking about cause triggering uh, the chemical reaction using lights. Mm -hmm. Being targeting and specifically destroying the cancers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about the side effect or you know uh, what would be the ongoing immune response at the time, but I thought this should work, and that's uh, I think strength of the amateurs. Right? Everybody in this industry for a long, long time, you know, are kind of trapped or, uh, in my opinion, paranoid. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I have a fresh eye. And now uh, we are in a, uh, you know, we completed phase two trial, and the, the result has been very, very amazing. So that, that's exciting. Um, Sid, you know, as somebody who, again, coming back to your role as historian and doctor, you know, we've had these moments of optimism where now we're talking about immunotherapy. But back in the 1900s, we were talking about radiation therapy as the great cure, and then uh, combination chemotherapy, um, which uh, in the early uh, cases of uh, the cures of leukemia and Hodgkin's disease, which I'm, I'm actually standing here as a beneficiary of that early cancer chemotherapy in the 1970s. Um, and then we had um, anti-angiogenesis drugs. This were, these were drugs that were gonna choke off the blood supply. And then we had the targeted, molecularly targeted medicines like Gleevec, which were the smart drugs in cancer. Um, and in fact, even before this, we had um, immunotherapies, super drugs like interleukin-2 and interferon, uh, which we put on the cover of Fortune in 1985. Um, you know, we've been through this before. Uh, how real is, or what's different about the immunotherapy uh, revolution that we're in now? Well, first of all, you have to think of the uh, our armamentarium against cancer mm -hmm. not as individual therapies but as the possibility of combine these are things that are additive mm -hmm. so in other words cytotoxic chemotherapy the kind of therapy that we use is great at reducing tumor burden it mm -hmm. kills cells and brings down your cell burden from billions of cells down to hundreds of, of cells thousands of cells but of course, it often doesn't cure. It cures some cancers, but doesn't cure many cancers. And those 10,000 cells that are left, 100,000, 1 million cells, then grow up again. And the, 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 you know, it's like beheading the monster and comes right back. Mm -hmm. Targeted therapies allowed us to use Achilles heels-like concepts to now uh, go, go after even those 1,000, 10,000, 1 million cells that were left and, and, and attack them with, with their particular vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Immunotherapy is, is yet another uh, iteration in this, but what, here's what's different, and it's very important, is that most of the cancer therapies that we were developing thus far were seed therapies, and this is a, an old concept that goes back to the 1800s, and it is to imagine cancer as the seed and the body as the soil, or the host as the soil. Um, the, the, the seed, of course, it, 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 this, this concept comes from the uh, great surgeon uh, Paget, mm -hmm. who made a very simple 
uh, ask a very simple question. I mean, if you read Paget's, I make my students actually go back and read Paget's paper. 1898. Yeah, so yeah. it's an incredibly yeah. important paper in which Paget just asks a simple question. He says, the spleen is about the same size as the liver. It has a similar kind of blood supply. And yet the liver is a vastly disproportional site of metastases. The spleen barely ever gets a metastases. Uh, he gives a second example. He says, breast cancer metastasizes to the bone but who's ever heard of a finger metastasis of breast cancer? Mm -hmm. You've never heard it metastasized to the axial skeleton, but not to the distal skeleton. It's the same bone. So why is immunotherapy different? Immunotherapy is different because it uses the soil mm -hmm. to attack the seed. And why is that important? That is important because now we're beginning to understand that cancer is an interaction between seed and soil, and that we know have to, have to understand much, much more about the soil. I'm going to give you two studies that were published recently that are very important. One is a study in which they biopsied uh, the esophagi, esophageal cells, from patients with elderly patients with and without smoking, smokers and non-smokers. What's important is, is, is the following point, which is that even within the non-smokers, mm -hmm. but especially within the smokers, you can see cancerous changes in cells, but no frank cancer. Mm -hmm. In fact, they, if you look at the esophagus of such a person, there are what would be technically called cancer cells, but they're not cancerous, they're not invasive. Something about their body, something about the physiological state of the body, whether it's the immune system, whether it is a metabolic uh, uh, milieu, uh, something is controlling or putting a back pressure on the development of cancer. So what I think is important about immunotherapy is actually two things, one of which has been widely appreciated. The widely appreciated thing is that it's a great treatment for cancer. It allows us to understand how to use the immune system against cancers that were pre previously very refractory to treatment. But the second thing that has been less appreciated is that it begins to open up the box of the soil. Mm -hmm. And when you open up the box of the soil, you actually find a kind of wormhole, as it were, from the treatment down to prevention. You can ask questions like, why is it that some people are not getting cancer? Is it because there's something special about their immune system? Is it something about their soil that we haven't previously identified? So it breaks it finally, I hope, we are hoping, all of us, that it will allow us to break through this kind of impasse that we were in cancer prevention by identifying states or identifying people who are at higher risk, mm -hmm. and thereby beginning to sort of coordinate this right. pyramid from the bottom up to the top. It's a soil therapy, and I'm very excited about soil therapies because they are a change in the way we think about the paradigms of cancer. I think that's, that's very helpful, uh, the seed and soil hypothesis of cancer. Julie, you said something really important before, which is you said as we age, we accumulate mutations in our DNA. Um, lots of accidents happen. Some of them are assaults from the outside in the chemical world or the physical world. Some of them are internal um, in terms of um, radicals, free, free radicals that, that happen and go into the body, oxygen uh, metabolizing um, chemicals that, that interact with DNA. And as this happens, you know, this accumulation of DNA mutations, sometimes it happens in just the wrong way and all the fail-safes fail and you start to get cancer. Are we human beings at an inevitable, you know, is this just an inevitability of being human, of getting cancer over time? It's just another, you know, breakdown of the body, as it were. Well, I, I think there's some plausibility in your theory, but um, clearly there's, so many exceptions to that rule that I, I don't think we can say it's an inevitability. Um, but you know, I, when you were talking about the seed in the soil, I was thinking when I was very young and starting out my career in biology, um, I was told by an important professor that if you understood syphilis, you would understand medicine. Then I became an intern and we had the HIV epidemic and I was told, well, if we really understand HIV and how it's interacting with the body and how it's evolving and the opportunistic infections and cancers that follow it, we will understand medicine. And now I'm really beginning to think that if we understood <laughs> cancer, we would really understand um, medicine and particularly the psychoneurobiologic access, mm -hmm. which these days even includes the biomes. 
um, because there's so much information exchange going in, on in our bodies all the time. It's not just a static process of DNA eventually making too many mistakes. Right. There, there are um, problems and then there are corrective factors and uh, humors and um, small molecules that are speaking to our immune systems all the time and we simply don't. There, uh, there are just, so many of these systems. Yeah. There's, there was the genome which was supposed to give us the code to life and then there's the proteome which is the proteins that are encoded by these genes and then there's the m metabolome which is all of the you know the metabolic yeah, things right. and the bacterium all the ba bacteria that are synergistic and so on you know and as we've come there are just so much data to yeah, process. And I think yeah. an, another dimension of this is, you know, the dogma has always been that as you age, your immune system gradually deteriorates. So that part of the susceptibility here is the right. accumulation and the other part is the fact that our defense systems wear down. But one of the interesting things that we see in some of the patients who are responding to immunotherapy is they're really old. Right. And so it, it tells you that when you turn their immune system back on, there's enough immune system there to basically cure their cancer. Right. Now, how could that be? I mean, right. it, it defies our, our traditional dog, dogma about immune is, senescence. So, so, Mickey, you know, when I was talking with you earlier uh, before the session, you know, it was clear that you were talking about antibody conjugates and this, you know, EGFR receptors and all of these, the sort of uh, the, the conversation of modern cancer and biology um, that you've seemed to have mastered in a short time. I'm guessing uh, that as your self-described crazy technology disruptor, that six years ago before your father's illness, you didn't know any of this stuff. How, how did you start to teach yourself about the, the sort of the, the cancer biology? Well, of course, uh, when we learned that uh, my father had a pancreatic cancer, I, uh, you know, visited and had a talk with the, uh, you know, top scientists uh, and oncologists and everybody. And during that course, uh, I learned uh, the basics of uh, cancer cells and uh, immune system and so forth. Uh, and then I, of course, began invested. I was so <coughs> in general invested uh, to this uh, photoimmunotherapy project, as a matter of fact. I funded like 95% of it uh, so far. Uh, and uh, definitely, I, I'm in a board meeting. Uh, I wrote, no, write notes uh, about the, the boards. Every, everybody's talking about what, is, what, are, what are they talking about, right? right? And go back and Google it and read, read many books. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm not, I'm really, uh, to completely understand. Uh, but I, my, our approach is not really uh, super uh, targeting uh, any DNA or uh, you know, RNA, uh, and I think the, the reason why I could have understand the approach is, is, is coming from a totally different angle mm -hmm. compared with other uh, therapies. So I, I want to jump into that because, you know, there are so many tech, tech entrepreneurs now who are yeah, getting yeah. into cancer, and there is this, this they're bringing a, a mentality of, quote, fail fast into the cancer research world and development. And they're really pushing the envelope in some cases into new science, into places that traditional science hasn't gone. Um, sometimes they're just faster in terms of creating um, genomic sequencing companies or others, you know, the tools of the technology of the world. What is it about I mean, the, the tech world? That can, what can the tech world bring to the cancer research world? Well, first of all, uh, including my project, uh, although this is for-profit business, most of the cause is coming from kind of philanthropical uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. So I put in $300 million. I think this is going to be hugely successful, but even if you fail, we don't care, right? right? Because it, uh, this is like we bring the money back to the um, society. The second, the good thing about this kind of philanthropic approach is bringing in the mentality of entrepreneurship to drug development. And of course, it's totally different field, but you know, entrepreneurs really care about the, about the reality, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in this cancer academic society, there are all sorts of uh, ongoing long talk, 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 uh, approach, let's just test. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and see. Let's just explore. So I think mentality approach are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, we cannot do it by ourselves, but we can be a great partner to the great scientists. So Julie, uh, you know, the minister, uh, Minister Spahn said earlier uh, about the cost of some of these drugs. Um, you work for a drug company, a big one. Um, just to put this in perspective, in the last five years in the United States, uh, the drug costs, uh, cancer drug costs have doubled in just five years. Um, and they're predicted to double again. In 2017, the average drug that came out that was released in the market was averaged $100,000 as an average cost. In fact, there was no drug in 2018 that was below $100,000 when it was released. If you're thinking about, as, as Sid said, it's, it's additive, the treatments. You know, we're going to be combining a lot of these drugs. You know, how can even developed Western countries afford this, let alone the developing world? How do, we got to get our hands around this, don't we? We do. And at the same time, um, Having cancer is very expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need treatment and chemotherapy and radiation therapy and surgery and all of the other modalities that come into play, the cost of cancer care is expensive. So what we really need to find are the ways that we can precisely identify patients who are going to respond to a given set of tools and recognize that the aim here is cure. Mm -hmm. So curing cancer is going to be a lot less expensive than spending a lot of money over an arc of time in treating it enough <coughs> and repeatedly treating it. And we don't think of cancer medicines as investments in cures. Mm -hmm. If you just look at the cost of the medicine, yes, it's, it's a large number, but if you look at what's the cost averted when you're able to treat with highly effective cancer medicines, um, you can see that it, that innovation is really worth it. And I just kind of go back again to the HIV environment, because when we were beginning to launch HIV drugs, we had the same conversation. Those drugs were expensive when they first came out. Yeah. And of course, over time and as the period of exclusivity ends, the drugs are now widely available in every part of the world at a price that is affordable. Um, but the incredible cost of care of HIV disease in 1980 um, really uh, justifies the investment that were made in the in the. What accounts for the rise, though? Because in 2013, I mean, and this has been happening for a while. You can go back and see this really kind of extraordinary rise. In 2013, the WHO estimates that global spending on cancer drugs, just on drugs, was 96 billion dollars in 2013. In 2017, just four years later, it was 133 billion, and it's projected to go again by that same slope upward. You know, what, why is it so, I mean, I understand why it's expensive, but why is it getting so much more expensive so fast? There are a couple of reasons for, I think, the rapid increase. One is that the drugs are working, so mm -hmm. we're using them in a lot more patients, particularly the current and hopefully future generations of the immuno-oncology drugs. I mean, MSD has, uh, has one of the immuno-oncology drugs, and we are having 900 clinical trials with this drug in 30 different tumor types, and we already have survival advantage in several. So, you know, we're seeing the right. in investment increase because the drugs are working, and they're working much more broadly than we imagined. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's true, and I, and I think it's important to say that the, the numbers are, are a little scary in terms of uh, the fact that even now, only about a third of people respond to these immunotherapies in the specific cancers. And melanoma, which is the most, the cancer probably most receptive to immunotherapy, uh, initial response rates are about 60%. But over a three-year period, it's, it drops to about 40 or 30%. And so this brings us back to the conversation you and Sid were talking about, which is that bottom of the pyramid. By the time we get to that state, it's kind of, it's not always too late, thankfully, and it's getting, again, possible to cure cancers later on, but we really have to address this earlier, Sid. Uh, there's no doubt about it, and, but, I, but, but the important feature of, of this is that, as I said, in the past, the, the, the three levels of the pyramid, by the way, the middle level is, as I said, early detection, mm -hmm. 
it were, were, were dissociated mm -hmm. um, from each other to a large extent. There were people who were working on prevention who thought of, 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 the, of, the, of the total sum of cancer money or the total sum of resources as a zero-sum game. Every money, piece of money that goes to treatment is taken away from prevention. Mm -hmm. that's, that's less and less true mm -hmm. because we are being informed by what is the biology is informing mm -hmm. us in every direction. I mean, as I said, uh, we, we now know a lot more about uh, immunotherapy. We hope to learn a lot more about obesity. Mm -hmm. Obesity is a, is, a, is a great example. In fact, I, say, I, 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 I made the provocative idea that we haven't discovered a carcinogen since the 1990s. We actually have, Sugar. although it's not <laughs> technically right. a carcinogen in the standard sense. It does not damage DNA as we understand it. But what it does is it might create human states, physiological states, that might be inflammatory, that might be otherwise linked to obesity, that somehow or the other increase, clearly increase the risk of certain cancers, but not other cancers. So we are talking about sugar, right? Sugar or, is one of them. Yeah, sure, what, yeah sugar uh, is one yeah. of them. I mean, there's, it's a, but, you know, we're running, actually, we ourselves, uh, yeah. we wrote a big study on this. Uh, it was just published in Nature. We're running a big study on this, starting very, 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 very soon, changing the diet to make it more receptive to chemotherapy. That's mm -hmm. our study. But so, what we're trying, what we're, what we're finding out is that from the that, that the that if the ecosystem would work correctly, mm -hmm. that we would be we should be able to find trapdoors or, or or real insights mm -hmm. between these three aspects of the pyramid, and that will move the clock forward because clearly something is you know we cannot afford to treat uh, hundreds of uh, millions of patients with extraordinarily expensive drugs. Um, especially if the responses are not durable. So uh, in a minute, I just want to open it up for uh, questions. So if you have a question, you know, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you, hopefully. I think we've got microphones um, in just a second. But um, we'll call on you in just a second. But I want to follow up on this issue of whether we are doing enough uh, in, in, this, in the science um, systematically uh, to, to have an, uh, an effort in the prevention effort. In other words, are we finding biomarkers that can warn us of a cancer state or cancer progression? You mentioned the fact that we really haven't found any chemical carcinogens of significance that we can identify as, yes, this is causing cancer, even though they may be part of a, a slew of chemicals that are damaging DNA. Um, you know, how do we change the culture so that we do shift a little bit more towards that bottom Impairment. Well, I think one of the ways is to be to have very strict criteria. I mean, I think I like I, I liked Mickey's comments about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we also the, the criteria for judging whether a drug works or if therapy works or a prevention mechanism works are and have been very clearly defined. Mm -hmm. We can't keep changing the goalposts, and the FDA has been very thoughtful for a long time. And CDC has been very thoughtful for a long time by, by, about making clear that if you, if you shift goalposts, things go horribly wrong. Right. So we, we, there is a process by which, by, which the, by which any therapy or any experimental modality is evaluated through a phase one, phase two, phase three tr tr study. It is uh, the, the endpoints are created so that we're looking for survival and mortality. Mortality is a very important endpoint because there are endemic biases in response rates and survival rates and so forth. We can talk about them, they're extensively studied. So you need to have hard endpoints, you need to have, you need to follow the, you need to follow the rules. And so on one hand, the entrepreneurship is very helpful mm -hmm. because it breaks and disrupts the ecosystem. But on the other hand, there's also pushback, uh, important pushback from organizations that know that by, by changing goalposts and, and making mm -hmm. language slippery, mm -hmm. it, it actually doesn't help. So, okay. so, Interesting. so there's, right. there's, yeah. there has to be a push-pull dynamic here, uh, and that's very important. Fantastic. We've got a question from Seth Berkeley, uh, the CEO of Gavi. Thanks, Cliff. And, and um, I love your Sid Soil kind of way of thinking about this. I want to build on what you just talked about, and it's interesting. I mean, I would argue exercise is an example of something that improves health in multiple ways, probably prevents cancer. So there's an example of something that can be recommended. But what we've also done in the past is we've had these crazes. I remember, we all remember Linus Pauling with vitamin C, and then it was selenium, and it was vitamin E, and vitamin D, and, 
And, and one of the challenges, I think, when you do that, it, it's the right idea, you know, how do you build the immune system up by, by giving it nutrition, but the problem is that when you put that intervention in, you change all the loops and you downregulate things and upregulate things. How do we get to an understanding of those interventions? And one of the problems with those is very hard. If you have hundreds of millions of dollars to be made for drugs, you have an incentive, but what's the incentive to do those simple manipulations, do the large-scale trials that are necessary to get us you know, simple things we can use globally on the prevention side? Yeah, that's a great question. I think so, one stab at it, Julie, I mean, you should, you know, take the first stab at, at that since you have been involved in a more global sense. You know, it's not an easy answer, obviously, or we would have already figured it out. But <clears throat> as we begin to look at things like single cell genomics, we, we can tease out the relationship between a perturbation here and the downstream or upstream effects of that. Um, it's going to take a lot of time, but as I said at the beginning, we have the tools now to begin to probe these things, and I think, um, as you were saying earlier, the discipline and the science that needs to go into being really clear about um, the, the endpoints that we're looking for, it's systems biology, mm -hmm. and so whether you're talking about an inexpensive intervention or a complex intervention, we still have to go through the same processes. Well, so the, 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 the simple interventions, uh, I wouldn't say simple, so it's interventions that are not pharmaceutical in their fundamental nature, such as diet, such or as exercise, uh, exercise right. diet, yeah. reduction of obesity, etc. These fall very much within the category of national institutes. So the NIH, for instance, is now funding large epidemiological studies um, and large uh, uh, dietary studies. We actually were part of them. Um, it, and these are really important epidemiological studies. So you begin by, first of all, being disciplined, not moving goalposts, and number two, relying on federal institutions, such as the NIH, such as European institutions, to fund studies where the incentives are not pharmaceutical. Um, and you have to empower them to be able to do that. You have to empower them with money, you have to empower the scientists to do them, the epidemiologists, and you have to give them the, arm them with the right language to do that. And then, simultaneously, you allow the pharmaceutical universe, starting with academic laboratories who work on this, including my own, to move along drugs that will treat, prevent, and, and, and potentially cure you cancer. Know, it's, yeah, you know, it's interesting, just, Seth, um, who represents Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, you know, it reminded me, you know, we do have some preventive, uh, preventive approaches to cancer. One is the HPV vaccine, another one is the is the cervical cancer uh, vaccine, uh, which is, is, has not been um, um, wi as widely HPV. endorsed as it should be. Um, and there are others that, you know, just from a vaccination standpoint, we could be reducing a tremendous amount. Julie, do you? Well, and, and we are, and, and in fact, one of the um, dimensions of this that's rarely discussed really is the success in, in drastically reducing the incidence of hepatitis B related right. liver cancers. Liver cancers, yeah. Um, many years ago, Merck Tech transferred our entire intellectual property for hepatitis B vaccine to China, and you can watch the incidence of, of, mm -hmm. of liver cancer in China go down over the past several decades. So you know, that's a cancer prevention vaccine. And, and we're seeing the same thing with HPV vaccine, the early data from Australia now just showing that not only are you preventing genital warts, but you're preventing um, the early stages of HPV-related cancer. So, and, and as yes. Sid was showing, it's also another dimension of the but, immunotherapy. But, but in fairness, the these are cancers where the infectious disease etiology is known. Right. I have a theory that there are other cancers that are probably infectious and sure. we haven't discovered that yet, so hopefully we'll have more vaccines down the road. But um, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's a technology that is, is sure. improving and we, we will be able to take some cancers off the table. That's exciting. We have another question uh, right in front of Seth. Oh, there's a, oh, this lady right here. Yes. Could you um, identify yourself too? Uh, I'm Caroline from Belgium. Okay. <laughs> On the level of uh, prevention, I have a question. How much more do we know about cancer being in our genes, being genetic? Like we know a few uh, genetic uh, cancers, breast, and, and we know a few known genes about that. Is there more... Um, Cancer Research. is fundamentally a genetic disease. There's nothing, there's no way around that idea. Fundamentally, cancer is caused by mutations that disrupt 
mainly growth, sometimes death, and you know, things that feed into growth and death, including metabolism and, and, and the way cells differentiate and, and live and survive. So, so there's no getting around the fact that fundamentally speaking, cancer is a genetic disease and will always be a genetic disease. Now, the question is, there are about four or five ways that DNA damage can occur, thereby unleashing mutations. Number one is that you can inherit them, you can inherit the damaged gene from your parents. So a classic example of that would be BRCA1 and BRCA2. So you can inherit that. We now know that the inheritance can be quite complex, and we're making dramatic advances in teasing apart the complexity of that inheritance. By this, I mean the following. If you take all the patients who have inherited breast cancer as a circle and ask the question, how many of them can be explained by single gene mutations that they inherited from their parents, it turns out only 30%. 70% of the patients who have inherited breast cancer, breast cancer running in their family, mom had it, grandma had it, et cetera, et cetera, 70% uh, we could not explain before because their risk was carried not by one gene, but by hundreds and possibly thousands, possibly tens of thousands of genes interacting with each other. We are now using computational algorithms, being able to predict that risk. Those women will hopefully be screened using uh, various techniques, mammography being only one of them, and hopefully we'll be able to prevent cancer in those. So that's one, is that you inherit it from your parents. Number two, you can get it because viruses go and tamper with your DNA. Uh, there are many examples of this, cancer-causing viruses. That might occur because viruses directly tamper with your DNA, or they create inflammatory milieus that cause cells to divide and therefore uh, make changes in their DNA. Number three is that it can cause by carcinogens. So chemicals, including radiation, which go and damage DNA in its chemical form and thereby contribute to the alteration of DNA. And number four, and that's the worst one, accident. So when cells divide, like all copying machines, they can make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, uh, you can get mutations. So really speaking, there are four, and you can say maybe a fifth inflammation, four or five mechanisms by which cancer occurs and different cancers use different intersections of these four or five mechanisms to occur. But fundamentally speaking, cancer is and always will be a genetic disease. So it's interesting because, you know, if you're talking about all the accidents that have to accumulate to create a, a truly malignant phenotype, you know, one that's capable of proliferating and, and metastasizing, it's a billion to one shot. But in a, in a body with a trillion cells, a billion to one shot doesn't seem so small after all, right? We've got a question over there. Yeah, yeah identify yourself, please. Yes. Uh, I'm Makoto Suematsu uh, from Tokyo, uh, the president of the Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development. And my question is, uh, I'm always dreaming of a global data sharing. Mm. Uh, and uh, particularly in Japan, uh, that we are uh, analyzing the, the, the uh, genetics of the super centenarians and the yes. semi super centenarians and the young uh, centenarians. Uh, they are all over 100 mm. years old. <laughs> and uh, that they are expert to escape from any kind of stress and uh, carcinogen, perhaps. And, uh, but uh, if we can uh, shake hands each other and collect these genetics data and compare it with those uh, who suffered from cancer, so can you, can you imagine if we can get some nice idea uh, which uh, never happened before and uh, making a new approach? That is my question. It's a, it's a great question. And we, you know, we've got a researcher on the, on the uh, academic side and one on the drug side. Uh, you know, how do, we, how do we improve our sharing capability? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. Um, I uh, am part of the National Academy of Medicine in the United States, um, it's, it, which is undertaking an effort to try to improve um, the processes for data harmonization and sharing. And on the most advanced level, that's a brilliant idea, and we definitely need to do it. But when you start getting down into the complexities of the governance and the interoperability and the ownership and the privacy issues, it very quickly becomes complex. And I think the um, opportunity in that space is for me metaware, middleware, where we need private-public partnerships, 
in some cases, research institutes such as the one you're describing or academic consortium where there are a number of data sharing agreements going on now across networks of academicians and pediatrics in particular comes to mind where we're working out agreements for being able to do that. But um, I think the dream of uniform data sharing is a long way off at this point in time. Well, I, mean, I have to say that the, that the success of, of data banking for cancer genomics has been extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The UK Biobank, mm -hmm. um, for instance, Example. achieved yeah. something that, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that be because of a, a variety of reasons, the United States uh, actually fell behind mm -hmm. in appropriate biobanking. So the UK Biobank is a very simple idea. It takes uh, the genomes, anonymized genomes of individuals, and attaches to them a whole bunch of biometric data, including how long they live, whether they get breast cancer, what, whether they get Alzheimer's disease. And already we're finding from that UK Biobank extraordinarily important information. This goes back to your question. Remember I said that 70% of those people who have, breast, who have familial breast cancer, mm. who which, whom we couldn't before detect, uh, based on genetics because the, the genetics was complicated. In fact, from the UK Biobank data now, we can find women who have a nine to ten-fold increase in breast cancer risk based on tens of thousands, I think it, I would say thousands of gene variations that increase their risk. Mm. I'll make one more point about this, um, which, is that it's, which is that in the UK, they, it, it required a change of culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it required a change of culture where, where people said that, yes, there is a privacy risk, there is a possible risk, but we will anonymize it very deeply, and we will only allow people who have signed lots of agreements, etc., are appropriately trained to have access to the biobank information, so that it just doesn't become a kind of free-for-all. In, in the centenar centenarian database, what's emerging is very interesting. If among the centenarians, among the, ex the super centenarians, in fact, the super cent although it's, it's a small group, people who live to 120, 118, 116, whatever, they don't seem to die of cancer. They die of degenerative diseases. Their bones break. They die of uh, osteoarthritis and its complications. They die of neurological diseases that are degenerative. So there's a lot of information in all of these biobanks, and even though we might not be able to share it globally, Mm -hmm. I think the, the UK Biobank has shown us very clearly that if you do put information into a biobank and guard it safely and anonymize it, you can get a lot of important information in terms of exposure, genetics, and risk. Yeah, that was a great, great question, and UK Biobank is great. We've got a question right here. Just let us know who you are, please. Sam Mamta, I come from India. I have uh, had familial breast cancer. I've been through breast cancer three times in my life. I've lost my sister to breast cancer. My question here is, every time that I have gotten breast cancer, it's a new primary. Mm -hmm. It's never been a metastatic disease. That one phenomenon I really can't understand, that how can someone get three new primaries? Precisely because of the genetic risk of cancer, which is being carried, so I'm sorry, in your case, as a hereditary risk. So, I mean, again, there is a, there is a I'm ignoring the soil component to this, uh, because we don't understand it. So there's, there must be some soil component to this as well. But as far as the seed component to this is, the, the actual development of the breast cancer is concerned, um, that is because there is clearly a, a hereditary risk. And that hereditary risk exists in every cell in your body. Every breast cell in your body, every breast epithelial cell in your body carries that hereditary risk. And it's a stochastic phenomenon, a statistical process, in which one of them is acquiring enough mutations to become a cancer cell. I'm ignoring the soil aspect of this. Sure. So the first two times my ERPR was negative. Yes. And the third time it was strongly positive. Yes. The, so that is, also I was. Well, this is, <laughs> but, but this is the kind of information that we're getting from complex genomic banks. So I don't know if, you know, in, I don't want to talk about individual incidents, but what I do want to say is that in the past, a, 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 a person like you, if they were BRCA1 and BRCA2 negative and negative for PL, you know, these other genes, four, five, six, seven genes, we would not be able to know whether you actually carried risk or didn't carry risk. We wouldn't know whether to screen you or not screen you, et cetera. Now we do know. We are beginning to know, we can identify with if, if the genomes of this audience were sequenced for breast cancer alone, for familial breast cancer alone, there would be one or two people who I, we would be able to identify 
and say that you have a nine to tenfold higher risk than the general population of having breast cancer. This is a small study. We have to generalize it across populations. It's a European study. It's a white study. It's a white female study. There are many ifs, ands, or buts, but there is definite progress on identifying women with breast cancer with higher risk. Thank you. And my um, last question a, is that um, if I ever were to get cancer again, would immunotherapy help me? I mean, you don't know my entire history, right. but yet, I mean, it's a very random question. We, sure. we can't, we can't, unfortunately, dispense medical device, uh, advice <laughs> from the from the <laughs> stage here. Um, what we've learned um, in this last hour, obviously, that cancer is extremely personal, that it affects people. Forget the statistics, as we've learned from Mickey and his dad and from you. Um, it couldn't be more uh, personal. We've also learned how extraordinarily complex it is. And if you had to find three people to, uh, to help solve that complexity, you couldn't do better with uh, Hir uh, Hiroshi Mikutini, um, uh, Julie Louise Gerberding, and Sid uh, Mukherjee. Thank, Mukherjee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.